All right, we'll call the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners meeting for Friday, March 16th, 2018 to order. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Hubs. <coughs> Deputy Director uh, O'Brien, would you call the roll of the commission, please? Chairman Wallace. Here. Vice, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> Vice Chairman Johnston. Here. <laughs> Commissioner Valentine. Here. Commissioner East. Here. Commissioner Young. Commissioner Barnes. Here. Commissioner Hubs. Here. Commissioner Almberg. Commissioner McNinch. Okay, and I, I have not heard from Commissioner Young. Uh, uh, Commissioner McNinch has let us know long ago that he would be unable to attend this meeting. So we will, uh, with that, I'll call for uh, county advisory boards to stand and announce themselves, please. Gillian Hunter, Carson. Paul Dixon, Clark. Pat Potsford, Douglas County. Scott Burgess, Lyman County. Lyman County. Lyman County. Okay, thank you and welcome. <clears throat> With that, we'll close agenda item number one and move to agenda item number two. Approval of the agenda, Chairman Wallace for possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. Has the commission had a chance to review the agenda? Questions on the agenda from the commission? Seeing none, this is an action item. I'll take it out for public comment on approval of the agenda. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further questions or a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I have a motion by Commissioner Valentine with a second by Commissioner Barnes to approve the agenda as presented. Questions on the motion from the commission? Seeing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously, seven to zero, with Commissioners McNinch and Young absent. We'll move to agenda item number three, member items, announcements, and correspondence, Chairman Wallace informational. Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record and correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wadley may also be discussed. Member items, Commissioner Barnes. Yes, I've, uh, I've received some questions from uh, some people in the Elko area concerning the uh, aerial uh, spring deer surveys um, with concern that they heard that there were not going to be any uh, surveys like in the rubies. And uh, just kind of wanting to know what was, what was going on there. They heard their helicopter or something wasn't available. So I just wanted to uh, ask, ask that question for them. And, and personally, I know that uh, given the winter we had, it was so open and and everything is scattered out that I think this, this year is going to be really important to do that survey so I kind of have an idea what that, that herd's doing. So that was, that was the question I had and I don't think there's any answers or anything that I could take back. But. Director Wasley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm happy to try to answer that best I know. It, uh, also offer the opportunity to engage with you and uh, <clears> the <throat> game division administrator, Brian Wakeling, but uh, it's my understanding that those surveys will be conducted. I think there may be some consternation on staff's part in how those will be performed, and I think there was a desire to use contract uh, services 
out of Idaho and the determination uh, was made at headquarters that that wouldn't be the most efficient use of our time and, and money to augment those surveys. There continues to be some dialogue between headquarters and the region as far as the most efficient, effective way to accomplish those surveys. And I think what you're hearing, I would speculate and say it's more a, a manifestation of some um, individuals that might be uh, less than satisfied with the decision out of headquarters. Thank you. And I guess I would offer uh, Game Division Administrator Wakeley an opportunity to expound on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Director. Um, I think Mr. Wosley summed it up very well. I mean, part of the challenges that we're working through is trying to, uh, you know, some of this unexpected weather, we're trying to continue to schedule our, uh, and work around the schedules to, to try and get these implemented uh, to the extent possible. Uh, as we do that, we also triage each of the ones. I mean, we have a, um, a date after which um, collecting that data um, is, is somewhat um, of lower utility. Uh, because we have to have it in time uh, to prepare our quota recommendations. And so uh, as we triage the, the units that we have available uh, that we can complete in time, uh, we often look at the most robust populations and probably uh, have the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the least criticality, if you will. Um, and for instance, uh, currently within the rubies, uh, our, our buck to doe ratio is that coming off of the fall, the post hunt survey there uh, was at 38 per 100. Um, it's a, the population is doing very, very well. We, we do intend to try to get it completed, but um, it's one of, the, one of the more robust populations that we have going into the spring. Further commission items? Vice Chairman Johnson. I uh, received an email from Rex Flowers making some questions about private contractors for as part of the predator management plan, separate from the plan that will be discussed in the agenda. I forwarded that on to uh, Deputy Director Rob so that I could get some responses, and hopefully Director <coughs> Deputy Director Rob will put that in the file uh, at the appropriate place. So, and once we have the responses, then I can communicate back to Mr. Flowers or if the department does that on its own. I, oh, I also received a telephone call uh, voicing some concerns over the new uh, online system. Uh, there's been some hiccups. I think that was all expected. That there might be some uh, bumps in the road as we converted to the new system, but I just wanted to say that I did receive a telephone call in that regard. So, and. I told the person on the, during the phone call I would share that with the department at this meeting. Further commission items? I, I too received a couple of phone calls over the same items that uh, Vice Chairman Johnson mentioned and uh, assured the, the callers that we would be good to go. Just a few stumbling blocks to get everything going. But uh, in my experience in using it, it's been good few at the beginning, but it's been worked out, and the department's working extremely hard on it to uh, make it a success. I appreciate that. Commissioner um, sure. Hobbs. Um, I'm sure just like everybody, I received so much correspondence over the workshop we're going to be working on, um, workshop 11, so I don't want to get into specific, but I did receive some phone calls, too, from concerned citizens. I don't know if I need to. I, I've listed their names. I can provide those to Suzanne, just about their concerns, um, but I just wanted to say there were there was so much correspondence that I couldn't even keep track of it after a period of time. Thank you, Commissioner Hubs. Further commission comments? Director Wasley, do you have anything further? The director's office also received significant correspondence. Uh, I, and we always verify that the full commission is CC'd on those correspondences in the event. <coughs> you all aren't. Uh, they're forwarded to you. I think there may have been two additional emails that came to me directly and appeared to be sent only to me directly late last night. Uh, I did forward those uh, to Suzanne for the record. Um, 
we're workshopping this item, uh, so there's no action, but we'll make sure that you are CC'd on those correspondences as well. Thank you, Director Wesley. Commissioner Hobbs? Um, just a, another, some information that was sent to me, there was an article, and I'm sure you may have known, written in, I think it was for the Tahoe paper, um, that was forwarded to me several times on the Black Bear Hunt as well. Further commission items? Seeing none, we'll close agenda item number three and move to agenda item number four. County advisory boards to manage wildlife member items, informational. <coughs> Cab members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. <coughs> For the record, Gil Yannick, Carson Cab. Uh, I received a couple of calls from people regarding the new licensing system. Those who just wanted to renew a hunting or fishing license, something like that. And when they completed the application, they wanted to get a hard copy. Cost them $5, so a $15 license combo cost them $21 and some odd cents to, to actually get a physical piece of paper. They weren't too happy about that. Uh, putting on a different hat now as uh, chairman of the finance committee, I wanted to remind all the cabs that it's going to be budget time. You'll soon be receiving correspondence from the department about the, filling out the form. Uh, we'd like to also remind them that we've started an audit program uh, of the various county agencies, uh, county expenditures for the cabs. So it really behooves the cabs to get after their members who go on attending trips and stuff like that to get their expense reports back into their city or county treasurer so that the information that they will give the department is as current as possible. Oh, do I do that better? I thought I had a loud enough voice anyway. Uh, so it, just a reminder to the cabs, one about the budget preparation, two about the order procedure and the necessity for having the uh, members who travel submit their expense accounts promptly. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. For the record, uh, Paul Dixon Clark. Uh, several things that came up and I don't have independent verification other than my two of my cab members mentioned that in Coal Creek uh, in southern Nevada, people are feeding the wild horses and so the wild elk have been coming down and eating also. And so a farmer, in order, thought, in order to keep the elk out of his horse pen, was throwing hay over for the elk. Well, the elk decided they wanted the hay with the horses, went into the horse pen, one of the bulls did, and gored three of his horses, and he had to put the horses down. So I was wondering what sort of education or other issue, Tony, if you'd heard about this, if there was truth to it, and what we should be doing about people feeding uh, both the horses and the elk up in Coal Creek, because that will become a major problem for people driving, as well as just, it's not good for the animals. That's number one. Um, the uh, other question I have for the thing is, I've mentioned several times uh, in the past, and I know that we just came out of LCB with the, uh, with the, with the ruling on um, scopes and, uh, you know, self sighting scopes and um, cartridge lengths and other things. And I was wondering when would be the appropriate time to bring back to this committee the uh, muzzle loader uh, handgun uh, ruling and to have a discussion on that. So I want you guys to revisit that. And um, I was asked uh, why turkey hunting requires a 20 gauge or larger um, shotgun for shooting. Uh, some people have 28 gauges that they hand load with heavy shot and they feel that it has as much terminal velocity as a 20 gauge heavy shot depending on you know distance and stuff and they were wondering why we have in regulation you can only use a 20 gauge or larger for turkey hunting. And so getting a response on that would be nice also. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. For the record, Scott Torgerson, Lander County Cab. We have uh, written a letter for you guys concerning our deer population in Lander <coughs> County. I will read it to you. Um, She's handing them out right now. Dear commissioners, the Lander County Wildlife Board has been concerned about our declining population for many years now. 
We do appreciate Endow not issuing any doe tags for the 2018 hunt, but we'd like to see some more done to enhance the deer population in our county. The deer survey shows the bulk of the deer population in the southern part of the county. As an advisory board, we re recommend splitting 15 into northern and southern areas to help with this problem. We'd like to also establish a quality trophy hunt, four point buck or better in northern section of Lander County. Also, our board would like to recommend an antelope, oh, recommend that our antelope herds that are thriving, like they are to consider issuing antelope tags, youth antelope tags to replace the youth deer tags in Northern 15. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you Scott. Good morning, Chad Foster for the record, Douglas County Cab. Um, just wanted to have you guys consider or keep considering allowing the bear hunt um, down into the Tahoe Basin and also um, the ability to be able to hunt them with shotgun, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Further county advisory reports? Seeing none, we'll close agenda item number four and move to agenda item number five. Approval of the minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Chairman Wallace for possible action. Commission minutes may be approved from the November 3rd and 4th, 2017, and January 26th and 27th, and February 9th, 2018 meetings. Have the commissioners had a chance to review the minutes from those meetings? Questions, comments, or corrections to them? Mr. Chairman. Vice Chairman Johnston. Yes, so in the January minutes on page 38, there is the notation that Commissioner Johnston moved to approve CR 18-02, the 2018 black bear season, including units 291 and 2013. I think that's just a typographical error. That should be 203. And my motion was to add unit 203 as an open unit for that hunt, which passed. So I just wanted to make sure that the minutes accurately reflect that it's unit 203, not 2013. Further items from the commission on this? Seeing none, this is an action item. We'll take it out for public comment on number five, and approval of the minutes for the three meeting, meetings previously mentioned. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or a motion. And, and before we do that, I do believe there was an email came in I saw regarding that so I, I think Suzanne is aware of it well, but we'll go ahead and, you know, Mr. Chairman I'd move, I'd move to approve the minutes as presented with the following correction for the January 26th and 27 2018 uh, meeting minutes on page 38 that the 2013 reflect unit 203 I have a motion by Vice Chairman Johnson and a second by Commissioner East to approve the minutes as presented with the change noted by Commissioner Johnston. Questions on the motion from the commission? Seeing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously, seven to zero. With that, we'll close agenda item number five and move to agenda item number six. Wildlife Damage Management Committee Report and Fiscal Year 2019 Draft Predation Management Plan, Vice Chairman and Committee Chairman Johnston, and Wildlife Staff Biologist Pat Jackson for possible action. The Commission will hear a report from the Wildlife Damage Management Committee Chairman regarding the proposed Fiscal Year 2019 Predator Management Plan, and the Commission may take action to provide recommendations for modification of the draft for the May Commission meeting. Jackson or Mr. Johnston? Well, I, I can give a quick report. We, the, the committee met yesterday evening uh, in Las Vegas, and Mr. Jackson will go through. The, the, the committee unanimously uh, moved to recommend adoption of the uh, predator management plan as drafted uh, to the commission, that the commission approve it. 
uh, the very little public comment or public participation yesterday, which stands in stark contrast to prior years, which I hope is an indication that uh, the predator management plan is, is proceeding forward and addressing a lot of the comments we've received. The one change is on the draft. It said fiscal year 2018 on the cover page. That should be fiscal year 2019. And additionally, um, as part of the statutory <coughs> rules that, that govern this, we did receive uh, comments from the park. Uh, however, those comments were not necessarily directed to the draft predation management plan. They were more general in that uh, the park recommended that Endow provide more options of projects in the future and the Endow looked at other areas for new projects. Um, that really wasn't specific to any of the projects that are being proposed under this predator management plan, but the department will certainly take those comments uh, into consideration in future years. And in specifically, I believe Mr. Jackson will confirm the park was focused on uh, Area 154, um, but they had reached out to the area biologist in that regard, and, and uh, so there wasn't much from the park to do with respect to the actual <coughs> predator management plan that's being, that has been proposed, and that the committee adopts, uh, the commi or it's recommended that the commission approve. Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. I have the same uh, short PowerPoint presentation from last night that I'm happy to uh, share with the commission now. Uh, a quick summary on where we're at since it's uh, pretty easy to get confused. In November, I reported on fiscal year 2017. Uh, we're currently implementing the fiscal year 2018 plan, and uh, I'm presenting to you for approval the uh, fiscal year 2019 plan. And all of our plans and reports are available on, a, on our website. One could uh, easily Google Endow Predator Plan to find that. Uh, just a real quick on NRS, uh, we generated uh, six, a little over $643,000 during fiscal year 2017, which is the year, most recent year we have uh, complete accounting. Uh, from that, $14,000 is allocated to go to the Nevada Department of Agriculture uh, for admin support, and then the remainder is outlined in the plan for uh, various predator uh, projects. It also goes to staff salary and overhead, and any remainder does remain in the $3 predator fee uh, uh, account. It does not revert back to any sort of general fund. So a budget summary for this plan. Uh, during fiscal year 2017, we uh, saw $643,233 uh, in $3 predator fee during, from applications. Uh, due to the 80% mandate set in place uh, from AB 78 in the 2015 legislative session, uh, we need to uh, allocate a little over $514,000 towards uh, lethal removal, and this plan allocates $549,000 towards that. Uh, so newly proposed projects for this fiscal year. Uh, project 44 is lethal removal of mountain lions and uh, monitoring of mountain lions in Area 24. This began as a uh, Project 37 removal project, uh, which is an existing uh, project. However, due to some mountain lion uh, interests and movements, as well as uh, the Delamars being referred to as a mysterious black hole for uh, bighorn sheep, we wanted to understand more about mountain lion uh, biology, hence turning this into its own project. And so we would consider this experimental management. I have a budget of uh, $50,000 would occur primarily in area 24 in the Delamars, uh, and then there would be divided up into two areas. I'll have a map here shortly. Uh, uh, part of the area would be uh, the sensitive areas for bighorn sheep and mountain lions. Any time found in that area would be removed. And then in a neighboring adjoining area, we would be collaring lions to understand how much they do and don't use that more sensitive uh, bighorn sheep habitat. And so the response variable to measure our successes, uh, we want to see adult annual bighorn sheep survival over 90% and or a uh, annual or a fall uh, female to young ratio of uh, 30 young to uh, 100 females. And those goals may change based on our telemetry data and or uh, other uh, information as it surfaces. We would consider that level of monitoring intermediate. Uh, this is the map <coughs> that you can see. Uh, I can't see what you can see, but uh, basically the red is the sensitive area where any and all mountain lines are removed. 
the adjoining green area is where we would be hanging GPS collars. Uh, Project 45, passive survey estimate of black bears in Nevada. Uh, the department would really like to uh, uh, be able to passively estimate our black bear population. That is to uh, estimate our population without having to physically capture, mark, and release bears. Uh, this would be considered an a, uh, experimentation style project. A uh, budget of $160,000, 120 of which would come from Pittman Robertson, and the remaining 40,000 from the $3 predator fee. And this would occur anywhere the black bears inhabit the state, uh, which is really on the, uh, the western side. Uh, and so uh, what we would be doing would be to passively estimate the abundance of black bears in Nevada, predict the density and or the estimates, and then provide guidance to the department on uh, how to passively estimate that population in the future. This would be a collaboration between uh, Michigan State and um, <coughs> Michigan State and University of Montana. Uh, and the graduate student on this project would be from uh, Michigan State. And the passive aspect of this would be a combination of uh, hair snares and trail cameras on a grid where every, I believe, uh, four kilometers, uh, there would be a hair snare set up where uh, a bait and a lure would be placed in a small square of barbed wire. Bears would enter that, uh, leave hair behind. That hair would go to a genetics lab, and that would be a genetic mark uh, capture and recapture study. And then the uh, trail camera component would add a, uh, a demographic of uh, um, potentially uh, sex, but then also age, you know, female with cubs. Uh, did we get all the cubs, et cetera? Uh, and so the, uh, the goals of this would result in a statewide population estimate, uh, <coughs> the ability to uh, estimate occupancy, uh, density and or abundance, and then also guidance to us and able to implement this on our own in future years uh, instead of having to reach out and collaborate with a uh, university. We would consider this level of monitoring rigorous. Uh, projects recommended for discontinuation. Uh, project 32, mountain lion, black bear, and mule deer interaction. We originally recommended to discontinue to year 2020. Uh, however, uh, reviewing the data, we thought that this project could end. Uh, we are currently uh, working with Wildlife Conservation Society to provide a final report on the findings. Um, changes to the plan since the last commission, we updated a few typos, uh, changed uh, projects 37 and 8 to include all big game instead of uh, just bighorn sheep, and uh, we'll be posting the uh, predator plans and reports to our uh, website. Uh, comments from the park, uh, these are the uh, comments we received in the letter. Uh, Endow will provide more options of projects to choose from in the future, and Endow will look at other areas for new projects. Uh, as Commissioner Johnson mentioned, during the meeting, the Callahan Mountain area was recommended for potential coyote removal. Uh, looking at the uh, three-year average of uh, mule deer uh, fall surveys, uh, fawn to doe ratios, I believe that was around uh, 55. And we, uh, according to the predator plan, would consider implementing coyote removal if that was below 35. And then reaching out to area game biologist Jeremy Lutz uh, he did not believe that uh, coyote predation was a limiting factor for the local mule deer population. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Questions from the commission for Mr. Jackson? Commissioner Hubs. Um, I don't have so many questions. I don't know if it's an appropriate time to comment a little bit more about the overall um, fiscal year plan for 2019. but. Um, overall, I agree with uh, Vice Chair Johnston. I think the plan is, uh, is, is really cleaned up, is a lot better, uh, clearer in terms of what's being measured and what areas they're at. One of the things I did want to point out is I think it would be helpful for individuals who are not familiar with these areas to put maybe the map of that area. I know some of them are statewide, and that was brought to my attention, but the map near the project area, maybe in the upper corner or something like that, so right away you could see where those projects are being implemented um, across the state. I think that would be helpful. I know it's toward the back of the plan. When I got to the very back after the literature cited section, you could see some of the maps but I, for me, it would be helpful to see it right where the title is so you can see kind of where that area is being worked and why and what species are there. Um, I just want to say, though, overall the plan, this plan has always bothered me because there's a mandate that's compelling that 80% of these funds be used for the application or, or to actually, 
you know, take down predators, where I would rather it be scientifically driven. That's just my personal preference. I think that um, we should be following more of a natural response to areas where there's uh, predation problems versus just rotely applying some type of killing or taking where just to try to uh, um, take care of all the money that we've taken in. I just don't, I, I think that's improper just from, from my background. So I'm hopeful over time that that might change and we will, the department will be given more flexibility to let their scientists just make those decisions real time as needed. Um, I also wish overall that we would emphasize more on some sensitive species since we have flexibility there. I know we focus a lot on the game species, but um, our legislation also uh, asked the commission and department to focus on sensitive species. I know we do do a lot for the sage grouse, which is great, but again, that's an upland game species. And we have, I know, many um, sensitive species that might have predation problems that could potentially be used for like experimental monitoring and that would be really interesting as well. Um, I'm also excited about the black bear study, and I'm hoping that this might provide better estimates of density and appease some of the public concern about the bear numbers so there's not so much discord. And I think those were my overall thoughts from this fiscal year plan. So overall, a, a good improvement. Thank you, Commissioner Hubbs. Further comments or questions from the commission before I take it to public comment? Seeing none, I'll take it to public comment for agenda item number six. For the record, Paul Dixon Clark. Um, this has been a, the, the predation management plan has been a, an issue of great topical discussion at my cabs for the last several years. In fact, I generally spend a third of my time on this plan because people get all worked up about it. Um, a couple of suggestions like uh, Commissioner Hubbs. One is that um, for multi-year projects, it would be nice to have kind of a running uh, financial tally of what we've expended on some of these projects over time uh, as part of the plan. Or if it's part of the report, then my real comment is, is even though the report sits out there and the plan sits here and they're both next to each other on the website, it would be really nice to have the reference in the plan that says, you know, plan page 32 and just drive people to things very quickly. So when you have a reference, it drives them into the plan, you know, fiscal year 2017 report, page 23 has this information. And it would uh, help people who have a hard time reading a plan and a report and getting both things because they, they, they seem to struggle. Um, and just to repeat something that we had uh, said earlier, is we've invested now over the last five years roughly two and a half million dollars in studies on Raven protection and control and removal. And we were wondering from the department if we could get a report on how close we are to being able to put together a new NEPA analysis to go back into Sacramento to look at whether or not we can revise the number of uh, leth lethal exit we can actually be putting out in the field and whether or not that's even required if we have the right plan in place when we're looking at Raven's location, removal, nesting habits, and all the things we've learned. Do we need to have more eggs? And so just having some sort of a an update on that so we could brief the cabs to tell them, yeah, we're gonna go back and do the NEPA and get more because we need it, or because of what we've learned, the amount we're getting right now is appropriate. And I guess I don't know the answer and it would be nice to have a report on that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Further public comment on agenda item number six? <clears throat> Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or a motion. Further questions from the commission? Vice Chairman Johnston. Uh, I'll, I just want to reiterate a comment I made last night that uh, I can think back at my first meeting when I was chairman of the Lyon County Cab and where things stood then with respect to the predator management plan and where things are now. And I want to thank the department, especially Staff Specialist Jackson, for the work and time he's put into this. I think he's done a very good job in putting uh, together the program that's addressed public comments, has been consistent with what the legislature has asked this commission and the department to do, and I, I think it really speaks volumes as to where we're at now versus <coughs> six plus years ago when I started uh, coming to these meetings as a cab chairman and what was occurring at that point in time. So I want to thank the department and Mr. Jackson. 
And with that, I would make a motion that the commission uh, approve the Nevada Department of Wildlife Predator Management Plan for fiscal year 2019 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Johnson with a second by Commissioner Valentine to approve the fiscal year 2019 predation ma draft tr predation management plan as presented by the department. Everyone understand the motion? Okay, call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously, seven to zero. Thank you again, Pat. That will close agenda item number six, <coughs> move to agenda item number seven. Commission Policy 51, Wayne E. Kirch Conservation Award, second reading, Commissioner and Administrative Procedures. Regulations and Policy Committee Chairman David McNinch and Con Conservation Education Administrator Chris Basie for possible action. The Commission will conduct a second reading of Commission Policy 51 and may take action to officially revise and adopt the policy. Mr. Basie. Good morning. Uh, Commissioners and uh, Chairman Wallace, Chris Facey, Conservation Educator, uh, Division Chief. Um, the Kirch Award uh, is being reviewed as, as, as Commission will conduct the second reading, as you read. Is there anything you would recommend moving forward with this? I, I, I have nothing at this time. We, we heard it at the last meeting and discussed it. I just wanted to know if you had anything to add that had come up since the last meeting. No. Okay. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Hubs? Just because um, I don't have a very good background sometimes um, as to all of these past commissioners, but I don't know who Wayne E. Kirsch is or his significance, and I thought we just might mention it for the record for individuals who don't know very much about that background. I might uh, hand this over to Tony. He has a better understanding of the history. Director Wally. Director Wally. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Hubs. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Kirch uh, was a significant figure in, in conservation um, in Nevada for, for many, many years. I, I believe may have even uh, established a record in terms of his, his service. Just recently, um, chairman of the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council, which is a uh, council assembled uh, numerous states along the Colorado River, both the upper and lower Colorado, um, the executive director of that group going through some uh, basement files in Wyoming, stumbled across the complete history of, of Wayne E. Kirch and forwarded that to me. I, and I, I wouldn't even want to begin to go down that road because anything I said would be a huge disservice to the length of service and the breadth of accomplishments that, that Wayne accomplished in his time in, in Nevada. He was a, a significant figure for a number of reasons. Um, and as I said, to, to even begin to discuss it, there, there's certainly no way we could do, do it justice in terms of its breadth and, and depth. Um, but I would offer to, to send to each and every one of you the, the full compendium of his significance to conservation in Nevada uh, as I received from the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council. Uh, we can also put that uh, on a future agenda and perhaps even in the uh, initial uh, correspondence portion of, of the next commission meeting uh, after I share that with you. and pay some respects and, and acknowledge the significance that Mr. Kirch has, has had in, in our state. Thank you, Director Wazley, and I, I think that's a great idea, actually. I, I, I would like to see that happen. Because uh, he's been a great contributor, and as Director Wazley said, to uh, speak to it off the cuff and do a disservice to the actual accomplishments and contributions agree with Director Wasley and everything he said there. So. Further questions from the Commission? Okay. With that, we'll take it out to public comment on agenda item number seven. Thank you, Chris. Seeing no public comment, we'll bring it back to the Commission for further discussion or motion. Mr. Chairman, Valentine. I make a motion to approve 
Commission Policy 51 as presented. I have a motion by Commissioner Valentine or the second by Commissioner Barnes to approve Commission Policy 51 as presented today. Questions on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously, seven to zero. That will close agenda item number seven and move to agenda item number eight. Reading, Commissioner and APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch and Conservation Education Administrator Chris Vasey for possible action. <coughs> the Commission will conduct a first reading of Commission Policy 50 and will discuss suspending the policy. The Commission may take action to revise, suspend, or repeal the policy. The Commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Mr. Basie. For the record, Chris Vasey, Conservation and Education Chief. Um, in the last committee meeting, there was um, whether it was going to be discussed to be suspended or repeal, um, and you asked for a couple options. I think at the time we were, uh, some things came up about a youth uh, program, maybe having something along those lines for artwork. Um, and then, of course, the cost, and we brought it in as the cost, and it's on a steady decline, the stamp is. And now we're into our uh, license simplification. There really isn't a purpose for the stamp. So um, the recommendation would be to suspend, but if you were to look into something along the youth end, um, there is a program right now with the Youth Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's the Junior Duck Stamp. And you could do a competition on that end if you want to continue the stamp, but I think continuing the stamp at this point for the artwork and how much we spend, it's not very much spent. Um, we're only spending really $3,700, but again, on the physical duck stamp, we're only, people are only requesting 344. Um, did the little research just to see how many are people are collecting. And on the collecting end, just this year, um, the artist has only been contacted um, very little, 40, I think they sold 44, or they were being contacted on the collecting on 44, so not that the year's completed, but there may be more in the, in the future, but on the collection, it's still pretty low. So, um, you know, it's gonna be what you wanna discuss as far as moving forward is, is if you wanna continue the stamp and the artwork as is, um, but our recommendation, I think, because of the license simplification and the no need for it is um, we, it'd be up to you. Questions for Mr. Vasey? Seeing that, I, I, I want to say a little something here. I know this is a, this is a uh, policy that meant a lot to Commissioner McNinch, and I'm sure he wished he could be here today to uh, put in his thoughts on it. And uh, I, I do agree with uh, Mr. Vasey that the costs involved and the participation in it has gone pretty low. Um, I think I'm along the lines of maybe if we could send it back, I hate to send it back to the policy committee, but maybe for a further discussion of doing something, but keeping it alive, but maybe not in the sense that it is today. Um, I guess that's kind of where I'm at on it. I don't know what the rest of the commission feels, but I don't know if that would require go ahead and suspending it, but put it on the radar of the policy committee to maybe take a look at and see if there's some options and if the commissioners have any options that they would maybe give guidance to the policy committee to look at. That might be good at this time, but I, I do feel like probably at this point suspending the policy is probably the best route to go, but maybe look at it as changing it around a little bit and bring it back to the commission at a further point in time. Commissioner East. Chris, um, I was at the Ducks Unlimited dinner last weekend in Reno, and there were a number of prints for sale in the silent auction. Is that a group that might be able to work with us on this? Have you? I, and I don't know the history of that, so I don't know if they've if, we, if they've worked with us before. But I hate to see this go away. It's it's such a tradition, and but I get it. And so I'm just wondering. And then the youth aspect, I I think would be awesome if we could just somehow get it get the interest back I think director Wadsley's reaching for the mic but I can I can follow up <coughs> I, you know I think this is a, a challenging uh, program it's a challenging program because of the the history uh, because of the passion tied to it 
um, but there's also challenges. So we have the federal duck stamp program. Um, even the youth um, art contest that Mr. Basie's referencing, um, it's you know, administered through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and for us to create a second youth program would be in competition with a program that already struggles to get adequate participation. Ducks Unlimited has uh, not had an active role in those duck stamp programs. Our program has been uh, largely sponsored and handled through the Nevada Waterfowl Association who came into our office within the past couple weeks and expressed um, their opinion. Um, correct me if your understanding is different, but their opinion was relayed to me as, as no longer having an interest in that and allowing this to go away. Despite the fact that that may be their formal position as the Nevada Waterfowl Association, there are several individual waterfowlers who have uh, the complete set of stamps. And I've had a number of people approach me and say, well, what about us people that have, you know, we've got a full collection? And the question becomes, um, how would you, the commission, um, you know, care to, to carry forward some program that allows for those collectors to still have that? And, and at the end of the day, it becomes that cost benefit and how much uh, time or money are we, um, willing to invest to provide that opportunity and, and what is the benefit to how, how many individuals. And as Mr. Basie said, uh, the cost to simply print the duck stamp are minor, um, $3,700 a year to print the department's annual supply of stamps. There are additional costs and personnel time to administer it, the judging, uh, the submissions, the valuation. Um, and then that, at the back page, on page two of that uh, commission memo, uh, it says Oregon and California still have art contests. However, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah do not. Washington's art contest is put in the hands of the Washington Waterfowl Association, and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is not involved. So there are some different <coughs> models out there. The question is, is there a desire to have some form of an art contest? Would it compete with existing art contests, for example, the federal uh, stamp competition, which is a national competition, any youth competition to potentially compete with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service youth competition. If not the department, is there somebody else that would be willing to sponsor and handle some of those administrative costs? If it is the department, uh, at what cost or what expense is that um, an efficient or effective expenditure of our sportsman revenues? So um, we'll, we'll take whatever direction the um, commission determines, and if it's to go back to the drawing board and bring forward some ideas that um, for your consideration, we're willing to do that as well. Further questions or discussion from the commission? Commissioner Ops. Um, so I don't understand 100% about the, the duck stamps. They were used in the past, but they won't be used any further. Is that correct? Um, due to the license simplification process? Correct. Thank you, Commissioner Hubs. The, the duck stamp has generated um, money that has gone into a restricted reserve account. So the money from those stamps went into an account that was specific to waterfowl uh, efforts, waterfowl work. And so the, what the department did in the license simplification effort was to say, all right, what's the average amount, average percent of our revenue uh, that has been generated from that program for the last seven years, took that seven year average and maintain that restricted reserve account. But rather than requiring individuals to pay that additional fee, have an additional privilege to have to affix that, sign it, we said, all right, that privilege is included in your license and we'll still maintain the ability to have that restricted reserve account. So that it's simplified without affecting that revenue stream, but in the process has taken away uh, to, to some extent um, that had already been removed and that people could have e-privileges, e not have the physical stamp, but just pay for the privilege and have that privilege. And that table on the first page uh, shows how many people actually wanted the physical stamp. Um, and that shows the declining interest in uh, people obtaining that, that physical stamp. Uh, and so that, that decrease in interest was already uh, there to a large extent. When the department simplified it, it then it kind of brought this to the forefront. Is there an interest or desire or a need to continue to maintain the creation of that physical stamp uh, given that low expressed desire to obtain the physical stamp? And I don't, what was it? I, 344. 344. So, so 344 people wanted that physical, that stamp last year. 
Um, and those 344 people are very passionate and uh, love their stamp collections and are some of the people that I think some of us are hearing from. And so the question before you is, is do we want to maintain that contest or that program in some way, shape, or form that allows for those people to obtain possession of a physical stamp totally independent <coughs> of that, that privilege. That privilege piece is taken care of. They don't have to have that stamp. So then it becomes more of an art contest than an actual stamp program. Yeah, do, you, do you understand? I, th I think the, f just for, it looked just like a stamp you put on an envelope, except you put it on your hunting license and then you signed across of it like the federal stamp. And then it got to the point where you get your license online, say, yes, I want my duck stamp, state duck stamp, and yes, I want my upland game stamp. And they were just listed on your hunting license. You didn't have the physical stamps. They were just documented in your license under, you know, I have my resident combo hunt and fishing license. Upland stamp, duck stamp were just listed below that, but I didn't have the actual physical stamps with the artwork. And now we've got to the point where you don't even have to pay for those additional privileges that are included because of the license simplification. So there is no requirement for the stamp. But we've been long removed from the requirement of the actual sticker on yeah. your license. It's from a the, one the charge, level. everything's rolled in. All stamps are included. <coughs> I think um, what's, what's hard, I know uh, Commissioner McNinch did, he got very um, sentimental. Yeah. It's very emotional because it's traditional. I think it, that's what it's, we're touching base on tradition and something that might be lost if we let something go. But uh, for me too, I, I felt, I always feel like there's such a, a connection with our youth, a, w a wonderful way to connect with our youth is to get them out and see wildlife. A lot of children never get to get outside city limits. Um, and in some way relate to them, whether it be, you know, it doesn't always have to be through hunting. It could be through photography, it can be through painting, it can be through, you know, drawing, whatever it might be to show, show some form of appreciation for wildlife. And I, I just wish that there was more of that. And I think it would be compelling to see if we could broaden that and have children get out and um, express their desire to want to be, or want to be around wildlife. and. Um, if there was some type of competition for our youth, I think that would be great. I guess that's my point too. I don't wanna, and I'm sure that's what you, what you do all day is to try to figure out how to do that. And um, when you see a program like this go away, it's just like one more piece of the of a way that the public can be engaged is lost. So um, if we were to let this go because it's just not logistically sound anymore, that's one thing, but I would hate to um, maybe not try to explore other areas in which we can have the public participate in our artistic expression of our state's wildlife. Mr. Chairman. Oh, oh go ahead. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, Mr. Hubbs, <clears throat> this, this program, and I don't know the average number of artists that have submitted, but this has been, this is an adult competition um, that maybe 10 or 12 yeah. artists <laughs> um, submit artwork to. There is an existing youth duck stamp program administered through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Nevada. Um, has pretty significant participation in that. I've been an active judge in that competition for several years running, and Nevada's put forward some some great art and has been represented in some of the some of the best art in in the youth program in the country. Um, I don't know that we would be able to seeing the struggles that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have in gaining participation and awareness of that program any kind of similar program that we would create, I, I think would be, um, would maybe dilute those efforts or detract from those efforts. I think maybe highlighting that program and, and encouraging people in the, the school system throughout the state to become aware of it and participate in it uh, is something that we could definitely do. Um, my personal thought and feeling relative to our duck stamp program is that uh, whether it remains or whether it goes, I don't see it having any bearing um, as far as an opportunity for youth engagement or involvement or appreciation uh, because of the, the, the fact that it's an adult. Uh, it isn't exclusive to adults. Certainly kids with the skill set could submit, um, but what we see is 10 to 12 artist submissions from established adult artists around, around the country.
further comments or discussion from the commission before I take it to public comment? Seeing none, I'll take it out to public comment for agenda item number eight, commission policy 50. For the record, Paul Dixon, Clark Cab. Um, I don't want to repeat the things that Commissioner East or, or Director Wasley have said because we had all those discussions and kind of agreed. The, the question or thing that I would add to that is, and, and Tony kind of alluded to it, which is for the federal dark stamp, is how do we market this process? And is there, if we market it differently, would we have a different uh, need for the stamp? Right now, we kind of just market to the hunters, and there's, as, as pointed out by Chris, there's only a few collectors who actually do that, but we don't do any marketing for our stamp. Uh, that I know of, and if I'm wrong, I can be corrected there. And so uh, we were wondering whether or not if we did different marketing, could we actually drive a greater need for this and the continuation of the program? Because there was an overall feeling of the Clark Cab that this was a, a program, like Commissioner East said, that people like, they love, and it's something that's kind of uniquely Nevada in an ever-changing world where we're going electronic, still having something hard and physical is kind of cool. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or motion. Commissioner Hubs. Um, yeah, just taking off on what uh, Mr. Dixon was stating, um, you know, I was thinking of those new programs uh, through, through my office. We use sometimes um, thisstamps.com, and you, have, you can pick out different types of stamps that you want to use for your business, and you can do seasonal stamps or whatever. And, I mean, maybe we are missing something if, we're, if we just quickly – toss it out maybe we haven't brainstormed through should we take a couple more steps on if we might be able to put our wildlife stamps in a different type of market and have these individuals participate maybe it's just not used for your license anymore it can be used in, in a different manner thank you commissioner Holmes. further commission comments i guess i have a question so if, if we continue with the state duck stamp What's the department going to charge for it? I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you're going to have to come up with a new price or you're just going to hand them out? I suppose the department <laughs> would take direction from the commission in establishing that, uh, but it is the question that I, well, that's then, going through my mind as I listen to this But then my question is this, how does the commission, if there is no duck stamp fee in statute, say, here's the fee for a duck stamp? Yeah, I I, uh, I agree, and I I think that there are a, there are some people that are very passionate about their duck stamp collecting um, and the heritage of this program. I look at the fact that we we went from 1,300 uh, physical duck stamps in 2012-13 season to 344. There were a thousand fewer. Uh, people that were interested in the physical duck stamp in a five-year period because of the availability of the e-stamps. Um, I listened to the concerns around maybe we haven't marketed it. Uh, there are 50 states that at one time or another had, each state had a duck stamp program. They're well known. I would encourage everybody to watch the uh, Million Dollar Duck, which is a movie about the duck stamp and the history of the federal duck stamp. Uh, to understand the art competition and the awareness that artists throughout, I mean, it, it has, the duck stamp programs in the states have made artists careers, have made them rich and made them famous because of the awareness. Uh, the, the notion that somehow uh, we could market that differently begs the question in my mind, uh, cost benefit, right? And so I, I'm looking at the expenditure of sportsmen's <coughs> revenues every day and bang for the buck. How can I take the, the dollars that we're getting from sportsmen and women and have biggest return on uh, fulfillment of our statutory charge for conservation and I look at a, a duck stamp program and we talk about marketing um, I'm what's going through my mind is is number one the capacity to do those kinds of things and number two what is the return on investment and so to your question what would we charge for that stamp uh, I, I don't know but it would at least have to make sense uh, fiscally to where we would generate money that would allow there to be some benefit, some return on investment that I don't know what that looks like. It would also presumably fly in the face of a simplification effort where we're trying to do away with stamps and make it easier for people to participate. 
Um, and so there, there are a lot of challenges, and I, I, I get the, the passion, I get the history, um, but where I continually go is to look at the 344 people that expressed a desire to physically possess a stamp last year, um, and our limited capacity to do things like market, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, conservation in the broader sense, and wonder if our time and money and energy to market some kind of an art contest or a stamp uh, would pay dividends in terms of delivering conservation on the ground at the end of the day. Further commission, Commissioner East. Um, just a little bit of history. Stamps are not easy to get approved by the Postal Service. I worked on the sesquicentennial stamp and it took a long process to get approved so I'm not sure that we can even use a postage it could be used as a postage stamp it would be a long arduous and expensive process further discussion mr. Woodbury uh, just uh, going to the, the pricing uh, currently NRS provides that the commission shall establish the price to be charged for expired duck stamps. It doesn't, and then there's a, a cap on uh, unexpired duck stamps. It doesn't really give a definition, but if it had no you know, useful stamp purpose, I think perhaps it would be included there, or included in the expired duck stamp, and so the commission would have the authority to, to put a price on them. Just one more quick question. From 2012 to 2017, we dropped a thousand of those. Is that because of the, because it wasn't required anymore for your license? Yeah, e-privilege, e electronic privilege. People could pay, pay okay. the fee, but not have to affix the stamp to the license, worry about it peeling off, worrying about not having it signed across the face of the stamp. It became simpler and okay. preferred by the majority of people who were paying for that privilege to not obtain that that stamp I'm, and i'm not a duck hunter well, my kids are but i'm not so i don't that hasn't been something i've done okay thanks and i, and I guess in sitting here listening to the discussion i i do understand where director wasley's coming from from the fiscal side of this and i i can i can feel from the commission nobody's wanting to step forth and necessarily put an end to it but I think maybe an option could could be to go ahead and suspend this, but maybe have the policy committee look at maybe something in, along the lines of a commission stamp or something like that, that if we could see if one of the waterfowl groups would be interested in helping share the cost of it and maybe continue the program, but maybe not do it as, uh, maybe do it on the commission level because it sounded like we could market it in some respect but keep the keep the program alive I, I guess you would say but not run it in the same way that we have been running it and that might take a little more work and discussion and figure out the angle that we can make that work from the commission level but that might be able to keep the program kind of going for a little bit longer potentially um, I don't know the logistics on that but that's just kind of the feeling I'm getting from the commission that we're not just like, well, let's get rid of it, we're done. This isn't working. Um, fiscally, it may not be working, but I do think there's some merit to keeping the program going in some shape or form. So I, any advice from the commission or the department on that, if that, if that would be the right way to go, to go ahead and suspend it and then have the policy committee look at a discussion on uh, a policy on the commission level. So Chairman Wallace, you were, you're referring to you carrying forward the administration of it of the of the stamp itself is that what you're suggesting but potentially uh, and, uh, and I don't know the ins and outs of that or if we could partner with some of the it doesn't even have to be one waterfowl group if we could get them to maybe help fund the printing of the stamps because I'm seeing that it costs thirty seven hundred dollars a year if you can and get several of the groups to go together and it may not even have to cost thirty seven hundred dollars a year if we're only selling I mean, I don't remember the number. It seems to me we were making 5,000 stamps. I don't even remember the number. We, we lowered it several years ago significantly to how many we required for printing. 
Well, the and printing. We lower it to 500 stamps. Yeah, and that ends up going to the artists for the most part because they're they're doing the selling of the of the stamp. We have some stamps that are used for you know purposes of NGOs raising money for sportsmen groups and things like that. But I think this would be much like Washington has now. Um, if you were to make this suggestion, and they would be administering something through the Waterfowl Association or something along those lines, and you would have them running the stamp contest, and it would fall outside of us on the administration level. Okay. And then maybe that's where the cost gets absorbed. That, that's what I'm saying. Maybe somewhere that it doesn't have to become a, a, fis a fiscal uh, burden, per se, to the department, but maybe the commission can do something or... Yeah, and, and I had a note from um, our, our staff biologist, Russell. Um, he said something about the flyway. All four flyways are having a suggestion to go to the e-stamp, and there's been letters of recommendation to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So they're all kind of moving this way. Right. So so this, if we were to make this suggestion that you are, it would really be, that'd be a good one because it would be, the, it would really be moving towards falling to the administration of it on, um, Waterfowl Association or, or an NGO group. Right, and, and was it my understanding that they came forth and said they were no longer interested? Yeah. I wonder if that was just due to seeing where we were, the direction it appeared we were going, or <coughs> because at the ju duck stamp judging, it seemed to, everyone was pretty upset that this would probably be the last, last time. So. And there may be other groups that would be interested in, in it. You, you know, we'd, that would have to be a reach out from probably us and, and, and uh, as the commission too. That, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I understand suspending it, moving forth with suspending the, uh, the policy, but maybe we can have further discussions. And um, I know Commissioner McNinch would probably have some, some comments on it. So, I mean, if we go through with this as the, the, first, the first reading and then at the second reading, which is probably it would be in May, we could have a further discussion and see if there's any other ideas at that point that maybe have surfaced. So. Commissioner East. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chris, what, there used to be a trout stamp. Correct. Is that still active? No. And when did that go away? Um, I think it was in 2000, I can correct me if I'm uh, wrong, Director Wadsley, I think it was in 2008. Um, okay. Roughly around that time, the, okay. the trout stamp went away, and um, that was same some of the same um, reasons. But then at that time, it was not being bought, and even the collectors were not uh, buying the buying the stamp and selling the stamp. Further discussion from the commission or a motion? I don't remember if we took public. I think yes, because Paul came up for public comment. I'll, I'll give it one more go at public comment. Any public comment on this? Come on up. Hi, I'm Diana Smith from Las Vegas, just kind of sticking my nose in your meeting here today. I, I was just thinking, I, as an ex-educator, I taught for, for 26 years in the, in the Clark County School District, and um, I wonder if it, it wouldn't it be go a good idea to expand it and maybe make it something like a Nevada wild stamp and have it be fauna and flora and we could get youth involved. Kids may not see much for ducks, especially in the larger cities, um, but they, they may see more, you know, they'll see the tortoises, they'll see the, the pictures at least of our state birds and state, you know, mammals and things like that. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Diana. Further public comment? Seeing them, we'll bring it back to the commission. And Mr. Chairman, I, I've got no problem with suspending it and uh, having the policy procedures uh, committee look at it and see if there's something that can be done. Uh, traditions are hard to give up, <coughs> but uh, sometimes traditions need to be given up. that a motion? If you'd like that to be the motion, yes. Okay. 
I have a motion by Commissioner Valentine with a second by Commissioner Barnes to move forward to a, uh, a second reading to suspend Commission Policy 50 and at the same time uh, sending it to the uh, Policy Committee for maybe a further discussion on options. Is that a correct summation of your It's perfect. Okay. Everyone clear with the motion? I'll call for the fit, uh, question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously, seven to zero. With that, we'll close it to agenda item number nine, status of commission policy review. Commissioner and APRP committee chairman David McNinch for possible action. The status of the commission's policy review will be discussed and items may be prioritized. And uh, I guess since Commissioner McNinch is not there here today, I will uh, do my best to explain kind of where we're at. I had some notes and did not bring them with me to the meeting. Um, Mr. Basie, do you have, you, you're probably not even familiar with where we're at on this, and Jordan's not here today, so. Do you? Go ahead, Commissioner Huff. Um, Just from going on my memory, the, uh, this came up at the very end of our committee meeting, and from what I remember, nobody really had any major input. The only, um, so basically, it's just a table, shows all of the, um, you know, different, um, the kind of the status of each one of these policies and what the recommendations are <coughs> and where we're at. But I do know that a couple individuals brought up the Public Lands Committee, Policy 64, Federal Horses and Burrows, wanting to know, this is still relevant, not redundant guidance from Commission on that one. And there was some dialogue as to whether or not we should revisit that or bring that policy up um, just because there tends to be a steady concern over um, federal horses and burrows and the situation that's, you know, just some of the environmental impacts that are out there in different areas of Nevada and uh, people not quite sure how those populations of horses and burrows are being managed and fearful that they're impacting uh, wildlife in a negative manner. That's what I remember. Thank you, Commissioner Ups. I, I agree with what you're saying there, and I'm, I'm glad you stepped in because I was having a blank moment there. So, um, questions from the commission on? So this is a action item. If there's any no further discussion, I'll take it out for public comment. Public comment. Okay. Seeing that, I'll bring it back to the commission. So I guess. I guess the long and short of it is, is does the commission want the uh, policy committee or either of the public lands committees to bring forth those policies for further discussion or looking at them? And I think that was kind of what we got at our meeting too. There wasn't really any flavor for going one way or the other on them at the time. So. Is that your recollection as well? Right. The only one that came up was policy 67, where I did hear a flavor for, for that one, that individuals wanted to maybe take a look at that again. And so from what I remember, Commissioner McNinch said potentially we should reach out to the Public Lands Committee and see if they wanted to um, bring that policy forward and take another look at it and see if it needs any updating. Okay. And I guess from my perspective, what is the Commission's opinion of that on a commission level should we bring the public lands committee should we bring that one forth or it was just down to those last couple that we hadn't discussed as a policy committee if I remember correctly and that was the discussion is whether to send it to the public lands or to have it at the on the policy committee level you know um, actually policy 64 is interesting too just because that's touch and concern the commission quite frequently the the input on land sales transfers and exchanges uh, with a lot of the transfers that have taken place I guess what we could do is look at policy 64 and policy 67 and see when the last time they have been looked at to be revised or amended I don't know what when the last time they were reviewed 
I don't either. And I, I'm kind of surprised that it's uh, the rest of them all have it on here. I'm surprised that those two do not. Does anyone with the department know when those may have been last discussed? <coughs> and without getting on our website and checking it out, I don't have any idea. Right, I don't have access. I mean, I could look on my phone, yeah. I guess. But. Well, I guess we could take it out for public comment and I could look on my phone. Okay. <laughs> Just so we know. We'll do that then. Yeah. We'll take that out to public comment again. Was The policy was uh, review 2002. Which one was that, Director? 64. 64. What about 67? 67. Two thousand eleven. Two thousand and two and for sixty four. And two thousand eleven for sixty seven. Just out of curiosity too, policy twenty four, um, hunting opportunities among weapons and hunter groups. Just thinking about the comment from Mr. Dixon earlier about muzzle loaders. I'm not sure if we that would even pertain to something like that, but it's about, um, I, and maybe once we get to public comment, you can bring up what your concerns were with that weapon, but it says opportunities among weapons and hunter groups. And I don't know when that was last reviewed. It says it's still relevant though. Okay, I'll, I'll take it out for public comment one more time. Is there any public comment on this? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission. Um, I think unless anyone on the commission has a flavor of reviewing those, I, I don't at this time. I, I, I guess it might. I guess my thing is, is we've got a couple of others, I believe, or th those are the last two for the policy. That's why we didn't. And the discussion was putting it towards the public lands committee. I guess was Commissioner Barnes. Yes, I guess if that without uh, without reviewing those two policies you know I couldn't tell you if we need to be be updated or, or not okay so I guess it's something that between now and next minute I could I could look them up and review them and then okay we to bring, maybe, my, bring my two cents worth in just maybe to, what we need to it's do it's pretty hard to you know just looking at with the title of it to understand if it's still relevant or not without I think it's pretty tough for us to, to make a decision whether we need to Review it or not, unless we <coughs> actually looked at it to know what we're talking about. Okay, I guess then I, I, I guess what I would like to see happen then at that point is maybe have the commission look at those two policies for a discussion at the next meeting and maybe move this agenda item back again to the May commi May commission meeting. We'll have the discussion again after the commission reviews those two because we really, the way the agenda item was set up, we didn't know to look at those two commission policies to. Commissioner Hopes. because the date of last review is not um, associated with it. So for instance, the one obviously for 2002 is kind of a blaring red flag for me. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, this, this process, the generation of this table was expected to meet the review criteria. That's, that's what this <coughs> the idea of review. So I think we're talking about different levels of review. So the review right. has thus far revealed that it is still relevant to keep. Um, and so that's that's what this process is to meet that requirement for review. If there's a desire through this process to do a deeper dive and a further evaluation or review and pretend, potentially amendment, um, and so maybe as part of this initial review, 
you know, you want to do a little deeper dive on 64 and 67, and it, it may, may be determined that they need amendment. Uh, but I think that we'll, we'll, in our records, they'll reflect that, that the subcommittee uh, reviewed the relevance um, of all of, all of these policies. And so the policy itself may not have a date change that says amended uh, in 2018. It was still subject to some level of review by this body to determine if it was still needed or still relevant. And, and I think, too, if you look at the color key on the front of that, the purple she has is no anticipated changes at this time. So, yeah. And I, th I think, in my opinion, that those, I don't see a need at this time to open those two up. That's my opinion on those two. Any further discussion from the commission? Is there a need to to move this forward to the next commission meeting, or are we good with where we stand? Well, it's, it's, my, it's my recollection when we went, there was the issues of potential land transfers. When we were looking at that issue, I think it was about a year ago, we were citing, all, I think, back to policy 64 and at that point in time did not feel it needed any revisions and set out the policy of the commission and provided adequate guidance as we looked at the issues uh, on, on land transfer. So I'd be comfortable with that one. And then policy 67, I haven't read that in quite some time, but I don't think there was issues there. Um, I think maybe my suggestion would be to give everyone on the commission the opportunity between now and the next meeting to read through those policies and then we could just have it on the agenda as do we need to do a further review I, I think that's the way to go too sounds reasonable to me and with that I don't I don't know that we need to specifically have any motions we'll just uh, agenda we'll yeah. just agendize that for the next meeting Commissioner Ellis. So uh, did you want us to remove all or just those two or three that we specified or talked about today? I, I think just those. Right. Remove, what do you mean by Well, I see right here they were saying possibly take a look at commission policy 67 and 24. We also brought up potentially um, 64 as well. So those three. So it would be policy 24, policy 64, and policy 67. I'm thinking that that may be a typo there, the 24. I think that may have been 64. 67 and 64. I believe that, that's probably what that was. Because that was the discussion at the policy meeting was the those two policies potentially going to the Public Lands Committee to look at. I, so, I think I mean, you're right. I think that's probably what happened. So yeah. just 64 and 67 yeah. before for our next meeting. Okay. Okay. Further questions from the commission? With that, I think we will, we will close agenda item number nine. And uh, before we get into the uh, agenda item number 10 with the reports, let's take a 15-minute uh, break to 940.